Hello, and welcome to this uh, conversation that I'm going to have with my colleague Patty Powers today. Um, I've titled it, Not Just a Box to Check, How Do We Really Go About Building Trust and Rapport? We know it's important, how do we actually do it? So thanks for being with me today, Patty. Um, Patty and I are both attorney advisors with Equitas. Equitas is a nonprofit that's mission is to provide um, you guys with innovative, informed, and hopefully really practical strategies to improve your response to crimes such as uh, intimate partner violence, sexual violence, stalking, and human trafficking, and much more. This presentation conversation really is a part of our intimate partner violence series that we hope is going to improve your response really on that, those basic levels of how do we uh, overcome the challenges that we all face. Uh, Equitas does this on a large scale through many different avenues, including resources you can find on our website, uh, web, uh, webinars, trainings, articles, publications. Um, all of that is uh, usually quite public facing. So feel free to kind of play around on the website. We also are involved in a variety of training events. These days, a lot of them over uh, Zoom or online, uh, more and more in person, both on really small scales and also larger statewide, national and international scale as well. One of the things we do at Equitas that is probably, I don't know, I think Patty would agree, one of our favorite things to do is to work with those of you in the field one-on-one -on -one and really try to work through case-specific uh, issues, challenges that you might have, everything from trying to figure out uh, who an appropriate expert may be, or um, maybe discuss a voir dire strategy. We are also really honored to be a part of several partnerships and initiatives, uh, most of them being federally funded, including uh, the Sexual Assault Kit Initiative, the Enhanced Collaborative Model Human Trafficking Task Force work and innovative prosecution solutions. So hopefully you can check out more of what we do either by following us on one of these social media platforms or checking us out online. Our website is www.equitasresource.org. But I'm, uh, before I'm really excited, that's how excited I am, Patty. I forgot to mention that we are uh, really happy to be supported by the Office on Violence Against Women, part of the US Department of Justice. They provide us grant funding that allows us to do these types of trainings and provide that one-on-one -on -one support. Um, but not necessarily everything we say will reflect their views. And in our striving to be innovative and talk about emerging trends and the latest research, we often will share with you um, property of others under the fair use doctrine uh, and obviously giving them full credit and acknowledgement. So now <laughs> uh, I'm excited, Patty, because how long have were you a prosecutor before you joined Equitas? I was a prosecutor for 26 years and I totally, I totally loved that opportunity. It was a privilege to work with victims and other multidisciplinary professionals. And I think in my heart, Jane, I'm always going to be a prosecutor. And I really look forward to our conversation today. I know you and I always still use like we, we prosecutors. It's where our heart is. And hopefully our work uh, continues to support and improve um, those of you that are still doing uh, the challenging work day in and day out. And one of the things that I know you were amazing at just knowing the person that you are is trying to build this uh, trust and rapport with victims that come to us in times that are uh, unimaginably stressful to say the least often. And so we are charged not just with, you know, proving the elements of the case, but we're really charged with um, being that leader in our community and protecting the victims in that community we serve. And to do that, we need to be aware of um, how do we support victims? How do we provide them with meaningful access to appropriate services? How do we communicate effectively with folks that um, are going through really trying times 
and are now struggling with trying to navigate the criminal justice system. And all of that is, is twofold. One is, yeah, we wanna support those victims, but by supporting victims, there's the, also the beautiful benefit that oftentimes we're also supporting our investigations and our prosecutions because we have this sort of ability to have maybe more enhanced victim disclosures. So I'm gonna start off with you uh, because we, I hear this all the time in training, you know, it, trauma-informed interviewing, first thing you have to do, build trust and rapport. Uh, what does this mean to you and, and why is it not just like a box to check off? Well, it's probably one of the most important aspect of our work as prosecutors, because what we're really focused on is the openness to build a relationship with the victim. And that means focusing on our shared humanity, recognizing, like you said, Jane, that almost unimaginable trauma may have brought them uh, into our purview, into our line of work. And so I think it really begins with a desire to build a relationship, but to do it in such a fashion that we're always open to the needs of victims and, and responsive to what their needs are in a trauma-informed way. Mm -hmm. I think that's so key that it, it's not, not only is it not just a box to check, but it's not something you do once. It's like, a con right. yeah, continual. And I know uh, we've talked about, you know, the benefits of when you do that right, when you treat that person that, like you said, has come into your purview, has come into this world, um, not voluntarily usually, and um, under a lot of competing uh, stresses and traumas. Um, if we do this right, we're gonna improve outcomes on sort of two sides of the coin. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure, and you know, I think the key language here is victim-centered because it's about the victim and it's about the circumstances that brought the victim to us and it's about what the victim's needs are. It's not what our needs are as professionals, but it's our openness to what we can do for another human being, in this case, the victim. And sometimes that may involve uh, a need or a desire for services, support services through advocacy. They can be invaluable for victims. It may be medical services. It could be counseling. But whatever that is, we need to be open to that need. And also, sometimes we even need to be proactive. It isn't very easy for victims to express certain needs. But sometimes just by building that rapport, by the desire to build a relationship, we're picking up more and more cues and more and more information that we can discuss things without putting that kind of responsibility on a victim. And when we do this, I think what we're really doing is trying to eliminate those barriers to not only justice, but to our communication. And in order to do that, we need to demonstrate that we have respect that we have understanding and that we're sensitive. So it really goes back to the critical nature of a victim-centered support. And I think in this way, what we really can do and are doing actually is building faith, not just in ourselves and in the relationship that we're trying to achieve, but also in the criminal justice system. I love the fact that you're talking about connecting victims with services and the sort of tension that I hear sometimes of being proactive about it, but also making sure you're not assuming what a victim needs. And there's gotta be a balance there, right? Yes, there needs to be. And you know, many times uh, we, we tend to generalize and that's something that we really should avoid. Not all victims, for example, may need or benefit from counseling services. But depending upon the relationship that we're building, we may pick up on very subtle communications of that kind of a need. And we need to bear in mind that this is highly individual. I think that's a very important consideration. Mm -hmm. And then the second half is when we do this and hopefully building that trust, connecting with services, recognizing and minimizing the barriers, which is a topic of its own that you and I um, spoke about in another part of this series, 
um, we're increasing that faith in the system. And then hopefully, you know, there's this, I don't want to say collateral, but there's this benefit to our professional uh, work as well. Um, because we'll have a victim that hopefully has been state has some stability, uh, feel safe both of me emotionally and physically, hopefully. And then those are the types of circumstances where they may be in a position where they're more able to share with us the information that can enhance our prosecutions. Right. And, you know, in that sense, what we're really doing is supporting a victim and, and really trying to enhance their ability to provide information that they're choosing to share with us. And by that, I mean the disclosure, what their experience of the crime was. By supporting this ability and this choice that the victim has made, we're going to be able to be in a much better position uh, to recognize evidence that is necessary to establish the elements of the crime and also the context of the crime. Mm -hmm. Other acts of misconduct, the history of the relationship, the context are so important. But when we get into this area, we need to be very mindful that we're asking a great deal of a victim. We're actually asking them to span out from their experience of the crime to basically the context and the development of that relationship perhaps over an appreciable period of time. So that takes us back to being victim-centered because this takes trust. And that's why building trust and rapport is so important. And as she mentioned, Jane, this is perhaps the best means that we have of supporting a victim in their desire and choice to participate in our work in the criminal justice system. So there are sort of outside I would guess, um, powers that be that impact our ability to build trust and rapport. Uh, things that we need to acknowledge and work towards either minimizing or eliminating, or at least communicating in a way that we acknowledge these things. Um, and so I was hoping we could talk a little bit about those challenges that come with our desire to build trust and rapport. You know, the offender has caused victimization. And because of that uh, causation, a victim may have suffered serious trauma. A victim may be incredibly afraid of, of even speaking to us or even participating in the work that we're asking a victim to share in. Prior experience that, that a victim may have had may have led a victim to not have faith in the criminal justice system or to distrust uh, persons who perform professional service in our system. Culture. In, in many cultures, there is a very keen sense of privacy and protecting that privacy and not providing information in a public venue. And these are just a few of the challenges uh, that there are in terms of our work, but it takes us back again to the need to be sensitive and victim-centered and, and recognize truly the courage that it took and the barriers that the victim needed to overcome to be present in our office, to be discussing their experience of the crime. And all of these challenges that we're looking at may impact a victim at any particular time. It can be during an early meeting that we have with the victim. It can be during trial preparation. It can even be when testifying at trial. So these are challenges that we always need to keep in mind. And again, go back to a victim-centered and trauma-informed approach to our interactions at all times. So what are some strategies to start building that trust and rapport? Like how do you even start the conversation? When well, I think you go back to <laughs> openness. Uh, being, being open to the personal and very individual reality of the victim that we're working with. And, you know, first and foremost, we really want to know how a victim is doing on any particular occasion. And this may even be an introductory question that we might want to ask. And then we need to span this out and really consider the environment that we're meeting the victim in. We want to eliminate as much as we can any indicators of power and authority, which may, which may 
make it difficult for a victim or may bring back memories of distrust through other experiences. So we want to be in an environment that can be open, supportive, and as natural as, as possible. And a lot of us, when we're, when we're speaking with victims, want to ensure that our professional work is accurate. And there are times that we may want to take notes. It's, it's good to the extent that we can to avoid note taking so that we can focus and be very present to the victim. And I, I think that's a really important term of art, being present. What it means is being open and listening and not being distracted by other considerations, by other appointments that may be waiting for us or calls that we need to make or a court appearance. All of that needs to be put aside because a victim can sense any, any distraction that may be taking us away from the victim. And unfortunately, many victims interpret this as perhaps not believing the information that they're providing. So to the extent that we can, we need to avoid note taking and we need to be present. Sitting behind a computer is probably not a great idea. And around the country, we all work from various kinds of offices. And most of them are vintage government offices that are not large. They have many files in them and have a desk that is usually covered with files requiring our attention. So we need to kind of separate from that to the extent that we can. And if we can leave uh, the area of the computer, that's all the better. Sometimes we can even sit in front of the computer uh, with the victim. But again, we're kind of trying to take our cues from the victim and trying to pick up on any expressions of comfort or discomfort uh, that, that we're seeing. And then practicing cultural humility, it is, it is an innate respect for the humanity of others and an understanding that at, we may consult with fellow professionals to come to learn more and more about a person's culture. We have not experienced that culture, but we can respect it and understand it to the extent that we're able to gain uh, this insight and information. Uh, thank you. And again, I'll, I'll let uh, folks that are listening know that we talked a little bit more about cultural humility in um, our conversation about minimizing barriers. And I, I love how the core of it is recognizing our shared humanity with the humility that there are differences that we may strive to continue to strive to learn more about, but, uh, but may never have the same experience than another person. Um, so that's really important, but I wanted now it seems sort of contrite, but I wanted to go back and talk about the note-taking piece because I really, it, it, it shook me at one point when I was note-taking because I always did it on my computer because I was like, oh, I want all my stuff here. And I would try to look at the victim, but I, I, looking back on it, I can't imagine how that must have been perceived by the person on the other side of my desk. Uh, so that I moved away from the computer and I started taking notes because I started working with victims that were and speaking with them in places that were not my office. Um, but then what I realized once is that I was taking notes um, and I would be present, I'd be listening. And then all of a sudden I'd, I'd go down and I'd scribble something and I couldn't help but recognize that the person I was talking to all of a sudden was very distracted. And what did they want to know? It would be like, what'd she just write down? And I think that's a common sense. So I started having conversations with the victims and letting them know, listen, I wanna make sure that when I leave this conversation that I have a good recollection and I remember that what we talked about with some amount of accuracy. So I may take some notes um, and feel free to look at my notes at any time. And I actually let them know, you know, after I take my notes, I'm happy to show them to you. And no one ever took me up on that, but I felt like that kind of helped um, get over that tension between us wanting to be present, maybe feeling like we needed to take some notes sometimes and also not wanting to be distracting. So that was something I, I worked with, but. That's a great point, Jane. And, you know, it really emphasizes to transparency. I mean, if we need to take notes at some point, we need to explain why that is and be open to sharing the notes. And I think that really takes away uh, from a victim's concern about notes. You know, many victims are very fearful of making that disclosure. 
And when they see us or someone else writing down everything that they're saying, I know many victims have a concern. Now, wait a minute, did I say that exactly right? I mean, this is now being memorialized or, you know, they're making a record of what I'm saying and I've been threatened to not say anything at all. So these are just features, I think, that we take into consideration about the victim's experience. Mm -hmm. And we're going to touch on some of that again as we go through it, because it becomes, I think, increasingly important um, when we talk about the progression of our conversations with victims. Uh, so this initial interaction, um, hopefully getting to know them as a human being. Um, and then I always sort of then went to a conversation about roles and responsibilities or expectations and sort of um, trying to, without giving them a full, uh, you know, lecture on civil procedure, <laughs> criminal procedure, <laughs> um, trying to, you know, um, communicate a little bit to let them know what to expect and things like that. And then the last piece was when I would get into the questions that were more geared towards, you know, what I needed you know, evidence collection, or I wanted to get the elements out or something like that. So um, I wanted to ask you what this middle conversation, what that, what that sounds like. Uh, this is, this is something that I love to discuss because it really takes me back uh, to the work that I was privileged to do with victims. One of the things that I shared with victims in, a, in a, our initial meetings and even later on was the fact that I feel privileged to do the work that I'm doing. I do it because I want to. I do it because it means a lot to me. And using, using that, I could, beginning from that point, I could segue into what I do as a prosecutor and talk about various aspects of that responsibility. But it was always in the general context with, I am so privileged to be here with you and to do the work that I'm doing. And I'm glad to have this chance to talk about it. One of my responsibilities is to give voice to what happened to you. And that's why I appreciate so much the information that you've been able to share with me. In that sense, as a prosecutor, I have the responsibility of advancing your case to justice. And it is your case because it is your experience of the crime. It's a privilege, again, to have the opportunity to do this work in behalf of you and in behalf of the community that I serve in. So I think one of the things that we should focus on really is being ourselves and talking about the work that we're privileged to do. And the fact that we've done this for whatever period of time and we're doing this work because we want to. It never was just an assignment to me. It was something that I wanted to do and something that I loved to do. And I, I really wanted to share that as much as I could with victims so they could come to understand uh, the commitment that I would bring to our interaction. I, I wish I had listened to this while I was a you know prosecutor doing this work because I don't think I was ever as good at making, not only do I want to know them, but allowing them to know me a little bit mm -hmm. in the sense of like, this is not like, I'm not a suit being a prosecutor like this, but like, I really love this work. And the things that I love about this work is working with people to bring voice to their experience yes. and to, ah, such nuggets of wisdom. Patty Powers. But let me ask you, because what came up in my head is there is sometimes a tension point where victims may believe we are their attorney. Yes. So how do you deal with that? That's deal with it in a very candid fashion. You know, it's I don't have the responsibility of, of representing you, but I do have the responsibility of giving voice to your experience of the crime. And I do so in behalf of our community, in behalf of our jurisdiction. And I think also that we need to be aware, and I know that this is happening much more frequently around the country, that many victims are retaining uh, private counsel. And we should certainly welcome this. It is a definite right that a victim has. 
and the fact that they may be represented by another attorney, it doesn't change anything that we're talking about. It doesn't change being victim-centered and building rapport with or without the victim's attorney being present. We still are who we are, and we still have the privilege of doing the work that we can, but we're recognizing that a victim may desire to have additional support in terms of their own counsel. I'm so glad you mentioned that. And I, I know we could have a bigger conversation about it because Equitas does have a webinar dedicated to um, civil attorneys and criminal attorneys and how that work can enhance um, the fact that we're being victim-centered. And so if you wanna go online and, and search for that webinar, I think it's called Criminal Meet Civil. <laughs> and, um, and we talk about that. And actually one of our former colleagues, Terry Garvey, did an excellent job with that one. Um, so along the line of that, these are, these are some of the important conversations that I reflected back on and was thinking about um, having with victims. And some of them are tough. Um, some of them are very nuanced. Um, but I find that um, that helps um, also building trust and rapport um, when you acknowledge, like, I don't have all of the answers. I'm not going to sit here and tell you I know exactly what's going to happen, um, but let's have this conversation together um, transparently as well. So the conversation about, you know, you know, what would you like to see happen which kind of dovetails into, you know, what does justice mean to you in this respect? And, you know, when we get into those conversations, we really are getting to know more and more about a victim's reality. And oftentimes we can learn a lot in this process, especially when we begin to talk about the process that we're going to be involved in. Many victims simply are not aware of what our process is. But one thing that most victims have in common, at least based on my experience, is a bona fide concern that our work is going to take forever. I, I can think of very few victims who didn't have that concern. One question was always, how long is all of this going to take? You're talking about an investigation, about following up on the investigation, about perhaps another interview and maybe going to court at different times. So how long am I, am I going to be asked to be involved in this? And that really brings to mind a point that uh, we need to share with victims early on. In, in terms of the pandemic, we know that we have backlogs around the country, but to the extent that we can in our jurisdictions, <laughs> we need to prioritize advancing violent crimes. That's so important. And so when we're having this conversation about process with the victim, we can very candidly and transparently tell a victim that it may take some time given the context of the pandemic and the backlog, but we're committed to advancing this case as, as, as diligently as is possible. And we're prepared to do that. So I, I think trying to answer some of those concerns in these conversations that we're discussing can be really important. Another consideration that many victims are, are very concerned about, who all is going to know about this? Uh, for a victim, and I think I mentioned this in an earlier conversation, it's almost feeling like walking into floodlights. There is a bona fide concern that everybody, and by everybody, I mean everyone is going to know what happened. And we know now with social media and uh, public records laws that allow for access to information, that it's very likely that information can be disseminated almost at lightning speed. So at this point, we're also going to talk about our responsibility to safeguard victim privacy to the extent that we can within the law. We also want to ensure that we're giving victims information about who they can be in contact with, with additional concerns. How can we be reached? I mean, knowing that most of us are in court just about all of the time, you know, we need to have a system developed. So if a victim needs to reach us, perhaps they could reach a systems-based advocate or a community-based advocate who is able to contact us by cell and we're in a position to respond as quickly as possible. So I think we all need to give some thought 
as to the information that we need to share, but also, again, trying to be proactive as much as we can to the level of victim concerns in, in so many of these, of these issues that, that we're focused on in this graphic. And I also have noticed that because there's so much online and um, because of the pandemic, um, a lot of victims are getting onto the clerk's websites and they're checking their case out of interest of what's happening with their case. And then get and then getting confused because they're seeing maybe court dates that happened that they didn't know about. And as a prosecutor, I could have I easily knew, oh, well, that's like a status thing, nothing's happening that day, blah, blah, blah. But it would rise, uh, the victim in the case would see it and it could really have some anxiety inside of them um, because they're seeing, they're like, oh, I didn't know about this or I don't know what was happening there or a amount of distrust because I hadn't shared it with them or the prosecutor hadn't shared that with them. So I think it's also really important to know that the victims probably will be checking that website that clerk website. And so to be able to have a conversation about what that might look like for them. And if they have any questions about something that they see, again, who can they contact? Um, I also wanted to put here, um, you know, do you feel safe? Um, how could you feel more supported? Uh, and a lot of these conversations could end up um, eliciting information that might be important. If there's an amount of witness intimidation happening which we know is so prevalent in these cases. And uh, another um, part of the series, we focus on that. But again, a reminder that you can't ask that one time. That's a continual conversation. And again, it dovetails with, well, what, who should you contact when you're not feeling safe? 911, who should you contact? Maybe if you've received a text message that you shouldn't have received, but you don't feel like it's an emergency that's another contact. And so that's a continual conversation uh, under in, in different um, aspects of a case as well. You know, one, one point of reality along this line, because I think this is a very important conversation is that for victims of violent crimes, of intimate partner violence, very frequently a victim's experience is that this is a crime that never ends. It doesn't just occur on one day, but it goes on and on. And throughout the process, if an offender is attempting to contact a victim, uh, for example, through friends or associates, or maybe jail phone calls, direct or indirect, what this really does uh, to a victim is again, to bring the reality of that crime literally crashing back. And so offering a victim resources, direct contact with us, the support of law enforcement and making the commitment, if there's a violation of a protection order, we're going to respond to it. We're going to be in court to do that. I think is it's, it's a critical conversation to have. And that goes to the question of, not only are we building trust and rapport on a personal level as the prosecutor that's handling this case on behalf of this victim, but our job as prosecutors also to build trust with a system and a systematic response. And things like that are exactly ways to build a systematic response. Because if a victim's feeling no one's gonna do anything about this, no one's gonna care about this violation, and then they've seen that there hasn't been a robust response to a violation of a court order, that there's some distrust in the system's response. And it's so it's incumbent upon us, not only to think about trust and rapport, that personal level, but on that systematic level as well. We yeah, talked, yeah. <laughs> you agree, <laughs> Patty? <laughs> well, uh, and being transparent too, I, I think is part of what we're talking about. We're talking about discussing with the victim all of the way through our, our interactions, what our work is and what our goals are why we're asking questions. And, and sometimes when we're preparing for trial, as an example, we will tell a victim, we're going to be asking them questions that will take them back uh, to their experience of the crime to allow them an opportunity to prepare for that, to have advocacy support if they desire it. 
And I think that's so important because it's almost like letting a victim know what's going to be done or what's going to happen and then supporting them and helping them prepare for it. Uh, sometimes when we're preparing for a pretrial or trial, we're going to ask questions that we know the defense might ask. And we need to make sure that they understand that these are questions that we expect the defense to ask, not that we feel that these are questions uh, that we would ever consider asking, but they're going to be asked. And so we wanna give them an opportunity to prepare in that fashion. <laughs> Um, that was always really difficult, even if I would put that caveat on, there's just this element of when you ask those questions that they, they at, often feared, these were the questions they were fearing would be asked. And then here we are, somebody that's built trust and rapport, and we're asking them, even with the caveat. So I found it helpful. I would ask the victim, what do you think the defense is going to ask you? And then it was the, then it seemed to come from them, and they they didn't feel like it was it was as much coming from me. So I would do that as well, and so that would that was a helpful way to 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 sort of bridge that really uncomfortableness because we want them to be prepared. That's a fair thing to do is to prepare them, but at the same time, um, you know, not let them think like, oh, this is the whole, this is what she's really thinking about the case. Exactly. I had. I think you might've been the one that told me, I never did like a full mock cross-examination with victims, um, but I would have the conversation. And somebody else said to me, if you're going to do a full mock cross-examination, you might consider having a colleague that's not gonna be in trial do it. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. You know, and, and different, different prosecutors develop different strategies, all of which can be effective depending on your experience. But I think it's so important to go back to a victim-centered approach. You know, we, we have been building trust and rapport and certainly a relationship. And so just as an example, if, if I tell a victim, I'm going to be asking you questions that I expect the defense is going to ask, I have every reason to believe that a victim would trust me if I have really built that relationship. When we talk about a mock cross-examination, you know, one thing that we need to bear in mind about that, a victim can be asked on, on cross-examination about interactions with the prosecutor or other individuals. And so that may be something that is going to be disclosed. So I, I think we, we have to uh, conduct our work in a way that's sensitive to the victim and also keeping a peripheral uh, focus also on discovery and, and trial testimony. I think your question also, Jane, of asking the victim, I, I really like that. I think asking the victim what they think the defense might ask allows the victim to really bring forward some serious concerns. And when we're working with intimate partner violence, we know that the offender, knows the victim better than anyone else does, right? And so your question is a very good one because it allows the victim to provide even more information about, about their relationship and what their concerns are. Mm -hmm. Which sort of leads into the next, which is when they are able to disclose those uh, that information that is so intimate and intimately known between them and the offender and that maybe at the heart of some of their fears, um, you know, how important it is for us at all points to treat that victim with dignity and respect and non-judgmental attitude. I, I think that's yeah. <laughs> very, I, just to emphasize that I think that's very important as well. So many victims blame themselves and they're members of a community which very often also associates blame with victims. And so I think that part of our work is, is also very important. And you know, sometimes uh, if a victim had previously reported and there was not uh, a viable prosecution or, or, or an investigation even, we need to be open about that. And, listen to the victim's concerns about it, but then demonstrate that 
this is different now. And we've made a commitment. Law enforcement has made a commitment. And this is what we're prepared to do to advance this case to justice. Mm -hmm. And I know that your work with the cold cases, the sexual assault kit initiative, that's been so important uh, to move those cases forward and to move past a sort of blaming attitude to a, this is now how we're going to move forward from this. So luckily, uh, you know, when we are able to build trust and rapport and when victims feel emotionally and physically safe to disclose, we can expect to have improved victim disclosures. And when in the context of intimate partner violence, it's usually not, you know, what happened this night, let's say I'm, I'm prosecuting a misdemeanor battery case. Uh, it's, it's usually not the, the issue of, you know, did he hit you with a closed fist or an open hand kind of issue. What I'm talking about improved disclosures, I'm talking about those facts that allow us to recreate the reality in court by um, admitting evidence of the nature of the relationship. And those are sometimes the facts and the circumstances that really provide the context necessary for a jury and a judge to make their appropriate you know, decision as to the outcome of the case. No, that's right. And we need to bear in mind also that sometimes a victim will disclose in layers. A victim at the beginning of our discussion or relationship may not be in a position or be able to provide the fullest amount of information. That may take time. It may take building rapport, building trust, building confidence in in us and in the work we do in the system. So we need to bear in mind it's going to take time, but also what we're doing is giving a victim the opportunity to give voice to their experience, to the relationship itself, the context of this crime, and maybe even crimes that a victim has not recognized. Uh, We know that sexual assault in a domestic violence situation is not always recognized uh, by some victims, but thanks to communication and providing insight and information, that may be something that we'll learn more about in our communication. That's a really great point. So what if, what if nothing works? What if we're, you know, we're doing our best, but these cases are challenging. And a lot of times it's because of things that we don't, we don't know anything about because we haven't been able to build that relationship. So what if we're working on a case where we just feel like we're not getting there? Um, You know, what do we do then? Part of our work is staying the course and leaving the door open. There's not an end uh, to the pursuit of justice for a victim. It may be interrupted. It can be interfered with. A victim can be threatened or intimidated. And like you said, Jane, we may not even know uh, what's going on in a victim's life. So that trust and rapport and the victim-centered and trauma-informed work that we've done really does lay the foundation to let the victim know that we're always going to be there. If and when the victim uh, decides or is able to choose involvement in our work in the criminal justice system, we're available. And I think what we need to share also at this point is we recognize even if a victim has not articulated uh, a discrete concern with safety, we recognize that safety is a concern for just about every victim. And we know sometimes that it's difficult, if not impossible, uh, to discuss things that rise to the level of fear. But letting the victim know that we have still that that kind of understanding, I think can really empower many victims to be back in contact with us if they're able to at a later time. And going back to what we talked about earlier, there may be other avenues to justice. Justice for a victim may actually have been making that report, providing that information, making a record with law enforcement. That may be the extent of justice that a victim is choosing at a particular time. Mm -hmm. Uh, Civil protection orders as well. 
Um, I would often work with victims that would pursue that avenue mm -hmm. and, and say, you know, this is really, this is what I, what I need right now for me and my family and say, okay. Um, and, but I think that demonstrating that the door is always open is really where we want to, to leave it there with, um, with victims that aren't engaging at that time. So uh, thanks for chatting with me as we've talked about really the need to spend some time and to dedicate time and to carve out time away from other um, concerns in our work day to build that trust and rapport once and over time. And uh, recognizing that when we do that work, um, oftentimes there's a benefit to the case and to justice at large and um, to just continue to always think of the, the person that comes to us in this time, uh, this very difficult time that they deserve our dignity and our respect at all times. So this is how to reach me and Equitas, the website is here. Um, Wanna do a plug for our office hours. Equitas hosts these every third Thursday of the month. They're an opportunity for prosecutors around the country uh, to join for a couple of hours and have a network of um, other prosecutors to soundboard with, to hear about new resources or emerging trends, and to really make those connections to build your practice of work. So Thank you for being with us today. Patty, it's always a pleasure. I learned so much from you. I appreciate it. Thank you.